I would like to welcome you to this webinar on the Drug Enforcement Administration's Final Rule on Disposal of Controlled Pharmaceuticals, hosted by the Office of National Drug Control Policy. This webinar is being recorded. ONDCP encourages webinar participants to consult their organization's legal counsel and applicable state and local laws to determine how the final rule will affect their current procedures and practices. We will begin with opening remarks from ONDCP's Acting Director, Michael Botticelli. Next, an overview of the final rule will be presented by Ms. Mimi Paredes, Executive Assistant at DEA and author of the rule. Next, Alameda County Supervisor Nate Miley will discuss Alameda County's Drug Disposal Ordinance. Then, Kathleen Pacheco and Bill Pollock will speak about Alameda County's Drug Disposal Program. Finally, we will have 15 minutes of Q&A using the most commonly asked questions pre-submitted by our audience. These will also inform a frequently asked questions document to be posted on ONDCP's website along with an archived version of the webinar. Please note that all lines but the speakers will be muted during the entire session. Without further ado, here is the Honorable Mr. Michael Botticelli. Thank you all for being here today, and we're very excited that we have so much interest in today's webinar. Uh, I want to first thank and congratulate uh, both Administrator Leanne Hart uh, for her leadership, but particularly the DEA's Office of Diversion Control and Mimi Paredes, who you'll hear from later, who was an uh, incredible point of contact and author of the rule. Uh, Congress de deserves a lot of thanks for passing the law, but she deserves a special commendation for writing the regulations, uh, persevering through a very long and complex public feedback process and interagency process. So we really want to thank her for uh, the work that she's doing and really want to have the bulk of uh, the time dedicated to Mimi uh, and our guests from Alameda talking about the rule and what are the opportunities. But just really wanted to go over a few points about why this rule is particularly important to not only ONDCP but to everybody on the line and then turn it over to the experts. Next slide, please. I think many of you might be familiar. The, the, this is recent mortality data released from the CDC through 2012. And what it shows, and I think we all know kind of the dramatic increase in drug poisoning deaths that we've had in the United States uh, uh, um, since 1999. And what you see here are um, uh, some trends. And I think notably uh, two, two trends that we should really take note of. Um, uh, I shouldn't say trends, uh, uh, past year changes. Um, and one was a significant reduction, a 17%, uh, um, uh, I'm sorry, uh, an overall increase from 2012 from 2006 to 2012, a 17% change, but a recent reduction from 2011 to 2012 in those drug poisoning deaths associated with opioid analgesics. And again, one year does not a trend make, but you know we're hoping uh, that we're uh, uh, all of our collective efforts are beginning to uh, take hold. When you combine this with recent national survey data, also showing some uh, decreases in prescription drug misuse. Uh, we're hoping that all of our efforts um, are beginning to take hold. That said, I think we are troubled by the dramatic increase um, in heroin-associated drug overdose deaths. So clearly uh, we have some work to do, not only in continuing to focus on uh, prescription drug-related issues, but the burgeoning heroin issue that we have. Next slide, please. I'm sure many of you are familiar with this slide, and I think it really compels us to why the disposal of prescription medication becomes so critically important to all of us. This is information from the National Survey on Drug Use and Health, and what it shows is that the vast majority of people who uh, start misusing pain medications are getting them free from fam family and friends who got those medications from just one doctor. So we clearly know that we have an opportunity here to diminish the primary source of, of the non-medical use of prescription pain medication by creating safer homes and getting the medications out of the supply chain. So we know that we have an opportunity here uh, to divert a major source of medication. And I also want to thank folks on the line and the DEA for the drug take that have already been held and the tremendous amount of state and local support that these drug uh, take-back days 
um, uh, have contributed in terms of getting a vast majority of uh, unused and unwanted medication out of people's homes. So uh, really thank uh, people to do that. Next slide, please. In 2011, ONDCP led our federal partners to develop and implement a prescription drug abuse plan. Uh, it should be noted that this plan was meant to augment our overall strategy, which obviously emphasizes things like prevention, treatment, and recovery support services. But this plan really had a specific focus on addressing the prescription drug abuse problem by looking at people who are misusing prescription pharmaceuticals, including uh, non-medical use, and those who are actively abusing and diverting these medications. Next slide, please. So here we are today, and I think this brings us uh, to um, talking about how we uh, uh, provide some level of clarity and information and begin to really um, implement uh, the disposal rule uh, that we finally have in final form. And this just gives you a checklist of the actions that ONDCP in conjunction with the DEA and Congress and the FDA to really look at uh, uh, how we got to this point today. So we are really tremendously excited that we are here to discuss the um, technical aspects of the rule to provide some guidance um, and to also enlist support in how we can work with our state and local partners to uh, make sure that we are taking full advantage of this final rule. And so with that, I'll turn it over uh, to Mimi who will walk through an overview of the rule. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Director, and to all of the staff at ONDCP for your support of nationwide and community-based disposal efforts, for organizing this webinar, and most of all, for your support and encouragement as we develop the disposal regulations. Your support was instrumental in getting the regulations finalized. We also could not have accomplished this without the combined efforts of at least 10 of the hardest working, smartest attorney drafters at DEA, our chief economist, and countless dedicated diversion investigators. Today, the DEA is looking forward to discussing the new regulations with community agencies. You all are important players in getting pharmaceutical disposals to be as common as recycling paper products. We hope that this webinar will be helpful and will give you the information you need to jumpstart collection activities in your communities. I'm very pleased to announce that as of Monday, November 3rd, the EA had approved 262 authorized collectors in the United States. Of these, 222 are retail pharmacies, 36 are hospitals clinics, and four are reverse distributors. The top three states with authorized collectors are Michigan with 56, and New York and Texas each with 17. Next slide, please. The new regulations are designed to give ultimate users, as defined by Congress in the Controlled Substances Act, methods to, methods to rid themselves of unused or unwanted pharmaceutical controlled substances in a secure, convenient, and responsible manner. Before these regulations became effective on October 9th, ultimate users who wanted to dispose of dangerous pharmaceuticals only had two options, turn them over to law enforcement or discard them in the trash. As the director pointed out, these limited options resulted in an unacceptable accumulation of drugs in household medicine cabinets, easily available to diversion and accidental ingestion. Next slide, please. The solution to this problem started when Congress passed and the President signed the Secure and Responsible Drug Disposal Act in October 2010. The Disposal Act provided the DEA with authority to promulgate regulations that would allow ultimate users and long-term care facilities to transfer pharmaceuticals to authorized entities for destruction. Now, there is language that unambiguously states that law enforcement can continue their collection efforts in the same manner that they have always collected controlled substances. We also specifically define who is a law enforcement officer for purposes of collection. We hope that these efforts will clarify the important role that law enforcement can have in collection activities. 
Because long-term care facilities face a distinct set of obstacles to the safe disposal of controlled substances due to the increased volume of substances that they handle, the Disposal Act created an exception that allows them to dispose of controlled substances on behalf of their patients. Next slide, please. It is important to emphasize that the new regulations expand the available methods of disposal for patients and their family members. Patients can still dispose of their pharmaceutical controlled substances by discarding them in the trash, although we hope that patients take advantage of the various disposal methods offered by the new regulations. Also, be aware that participating in a collection program is completely voluntary. The Disposal Act prohibits the DEA from mandating that any entity establish or operate a delivery or disposal program. Next slide, please. We hope that the final rule results in safe and secure collection activities that make it convenient for patients to responsibly dispose of their unwanted pharmaceutical controlled substances. The DEA also hopes that convenience will result in increased disposal which in, will in turn decrease the supply of these substances in household medicine cabinets and also protect the environment. Next slide, please. Again, law enforcement can continue their collection activities under the new regulations to include maintaining collection receptacles, conducting take-back events, and also conducting mail-back programs. The regulations permit any entity to partner with law enforcement to hold any of these activities. We encourage law enforcement to partner with their communities to conduct these activities. The DEA believes that implementation of disposal methods is best tailored to local communities by local communities, and we encourage public and private partnerships that provide cost-effective, safe, and convenient options for the public. Next slide, please. The DEA started coordinating nationwide take-back events in 2010, and since then, in nine nationwide events, the DEA and more than 4,000 of our law enforcement partners collected and destroyed more than 2,000 tons of drugs. These statistics demonstrate that take-back events play a very important role in getting dangerous drugs out of our household medicine cabinets. With this in mind, we designed the regulations to maximize public participation in take-back events and reduce unnecessary burdens on law enforcement. Under the new regulations, when law enforcement conducts a take-back event, a law enforcement officer employed by the agency must oversee the collection. Oversee has its common everyday meaning, to supervise, manage, watch over, and direct in an official capacity. The direct participation in the new rule mandate means that a law enforcement officer must maintain control and custody of the collected substances from the time they are collected until secure transfer, storage, or destruction. To provide clarity, the new regulations also define a law enforcement officer as a person who is an employee of a law enforcement agency or a law enforcement component of a federal agency who is under the direction and control of a federal, state, tribal, or local government acting in the course of his or her official duty and who is duly sworn and given the authority by a federal, state, tribal, or local government to carry firearms, execute and serve warrants, make arrests without warrant, and make seizures of property. Also included in the definition are Veterans Health Administration and DOD police officers. Next slide, please. We want to emphasize that law enforcement is not required to follow the physical security requirements outlined in the new regulations for handling and storing collected substances. There are no restrictions on how law enforcement handles the collected substances so long as they maintain control and custody of the substances collected. The DEA recognizes that law enforcement agencies have existing procedures regarding the handling, storage, and transfer of controlled substances. 
the new regulations do not require changes to those procedures. Rather, the DEA anticipates that those existing procedures will provide the necessary security to prevent the diversion of controlled substances during the collection process. That said, law enforcement can conduct a take-back event in conjunction with any other event. And non-law enforcement personnel can assist with take-back events. For example, non-law enforcement personnel can poll ultimate users about the substances they are discarding, or by assisting ultimate users to separate controlled from non-controlled substances. Next slide, please. Let's move on to collection by authorized registrants. To provide clarity for the public and registrants, we define collection in the new regulations. Only three categories of people may transfer their lawfully possessed pharmaceutical controlled substances to an authorized collector or to law enforcement. An ultimate user, as defined in the Controlled Substances Act, a person lawfully entitled to dispose of an ultimate user of decedent's property, and a long-term care facility on behalf of a patient resident. Next slide, please. The new regulations also define collector as a registered manufacturer, distributor, reverse distributor, narcotic treatment program, hospital clinic with an on-site pharmacy, or a retail pharmacy that is authorized to collect controlled substances for the purpose of destruction. The DEA authorized certain registrant categories to be collectors so that DEA can ensure sufficient physical security controls are in place thereby minimizing the risk of diversion. Registrants are subject to controls related to their DEA registration and have experience handling pharmaceutical controlled substances. These factors will protect against the diversion of controlled substances during the collection process. Next slide, please. To become an authorized collector, the registrant must have authority to handle Schedule II controlled substances. The registrant must also have authority from the state to take back controlled substances. Some states do not allow registrants to conduct take backs, to include Georgia, Hawaii, and Oklahoma, to name a few. Registrants can modify their registration online for free. Required information includes the registrant's name, address, and DEA number, as well as the method of collection. If the method of collection is a mailback program, the registrant will be asked to verify that it does have and will utilize an on-site method of destruction to destroy return mailback packages. On-site means located on or at the physical premises of the registrant's registered location. So a controlled substance is destroyed on-site when destruction occurs on the physical premises of the destroying registrant's registered location. Also, we have been asked which entity has to become the authorized collector in a mailback partnership. For example, a retail pharmacy partners with a reverse distributor to conduct the mailback program. The retail pharmacy makes the mailback packages easily accessible to the public, and the reverse distributor receives sealed mailback packages and destroys them on site. If the retail pharmacy is only making empty mailback packages available to the public at the pharmacy, then the pharmacy does not have to modify its registration to become a collector. In this scenario, only the reverse distributor would need to modify its registration to become an authorized collector. Next slide, please. And as we discussed, regulations allow authorized collectors to place collection receptacles at the registered location and to conduct a mailback program. Next slide, please. Security measures required by the new regulations are the minimum necessary to ensure a safe and secure means of disposal and to provide mechanisms designed to prevent, detect, and deter diversion. That's why only ultimate users, those lawfully entitled to dispose of an ultimate user's decedent's property, and long-term care facility employees 
they place substances into a receptacle. And once deposited, the substances cannot be individually handled. Also, the receptacles are for the disposal of only ultimate user substances. Registrants cannot dispose of their expired or unusable inventory in a receptacle. There are specific separate rules regarding how a registrant may dispose of its stock or inventory. Next slide, please. We have received some inquiries regarding where registrants can get collection receptacles that meet the requirements of the new rule. While DEA cannot endorse or promote any particular vendor or brand of receptacle, I can tell you that receptacles are in the marketplace and are available for purchase. Here is a photo of a collection receptacle that meets the three physical security requirements. It's securely fastened to a permanent structure. It is securely locked and substantially constructed. And it has an opening that allows for contents to be added but does not allow for removal. Next slide, please. Here is another example of a receptacle that meets the requirements. An important physical security requirement for collection receptacles is that they be placed inside the registered location or law enforcement location and inside an authorized long-term care facility. Collection receptacles located outside lack adequate control and monitoring and are easily susceptible to tampering and theft. Next slide, please. Where can the receptacles be placed? The general rule is that receptacles must be placed in the immediate proximity of an area where controlled substances are stored and at which an employee is present. For example, at a retail pharmacy, it would be appropriate to place a receptacle in the pharmacy waiting area within sight of a pharmacy employee. When the pharmacy is closed, the receptacle is locked or is otherwise made inaccessible. At a long-term care facility, it will be located in an area regularly monitored by facility employees. For example, the nurse's station. At a hospital clinic with an on-site pharmacy, the receptacle only has to be located in an area regularly monitored by employees, but not near the emergency department. This is because in the DEA's experience, the risk of diversion is high in areas where emergency or urgent care is provided due to the often chaotic environment and the extended amounts of time persons spend in such areas. At a narcotic treatment program, the receptacle will be located in a securely locked room that does not contain any other controlled substances. This requirement is designed to minimize the risk of diversion in light of the unique security challenges and heightened diversion risks that narcotic treatment programs face. Next slide, please. Another important security feature of the collection receptacle is the removable inner liner. Similar to the receptacle requirements, the inner liner requirements are designed to help detect, deter, and prevent the diversion of collected substances. For example, the inner liner must be removable and sealable without touching the content. It must also be opaque, waterproof, tamper evident, and tear resistant. Also, the outside of each inner liner must be marked with the size of the liner and a unique identification number. For example, an inner liner in the inventory of ABC Pharmacy might be marked as ABC 2014-001, 10 gallons. The unique identification number can be anything, so long as it is unique to the registrant. Next slide, please. Other important security requirements pertain to access and handling of sealed inner liners. Again, these requirements are designed to minimize the risk of diversion during the collection and destruction process. Two employees must seal the inner liner upon removal. And once sealed, it cannot be opened, x-rayed, or otherwise penetrated. Registrants must also keep a record of the names and signatures 
of the two employees who field and stored each inner liner, as well as the two employees who transferred the field inner liner for destruction. Next slide, please. A mailback program is subject to many of the same collection requirements as receptacles. For example, only Schedule 2 through 5 controlled substances may be collected, and controlled and non-controlled substances can be commingled, although it is not required. Next slide, please. As discussed earlier, the mailback program collector must have and utilize an on-site method of destruction. The on-site method of destruction must render the controlled substances non-retrievable. Similar to the other new requirements, this requirement is designed to prevent diversion of these substances to illicit purposes and to protect the public health and safety. Non-retrievable is defined in the regulation, but a controlled substance is considered non-retrievable when it cannot be transformed to a physical or chemical condition or state as a controlled substance or controlled substance analog. Next slide, please. The DEA carefully considered the diversion risks inherent to mailback programs. We believe that the risks of diversion associated with mailback programs are great because of necessary actions including the handling of the packages, mail sorting, and mail delivery by non-registrants. To balance those risks, the DEA believes that the security measures in the new regulations are the minimum required to reduce the risk of diversion inherent to mailback programs. For example, the packages must be postage paid and pre-addressed and be accompanied by mailing instructions. These measures will help ensure the sealed package is properly delivered to the correct collector. Next slide, please. As I mentioned earlier, controlled substances must be rendered non-retrievable, but they must also be destroyed in compliance with all other applicable federal, state, tribal, and local laws and regulations. For example, there are some federal and state level environmental and transportation laws that might apply to each individual situation. In the final role, we try to reference some of the federal laws that might be applicable. However, we encourage everyone to be aware of other applicable state laws as well. Next slide, please. The authorized collector that receives a sealed mailback package is required to either promptly destroy it or store it until on-site destruction occurs. With regard to storage, non-practitioners like reverse distributors must store sealed mailback packages just as they would Schedule II controlled substances. On the other hand, practitioners, like retail pharmacies, must store sealed mailback packages in a securely locked, substantially constructed cabinet or a securely locked room with controlled access. Next slide, please. The methods to dispose of sealed inner liners depends on whether the collector is a practitioner like a retail pharmacy or a non-practitioner like a reverse distributor. Both can destroy on-site if the method renders substances non-retrievable and is in accordance with all other laws and regulations. Both can deliver to a reverse distributor by common or contract carrier or by reverse distributor pickup. Both can also deliver to a distributor by common or contract carrier or distributor pickup. Practitioners also retain the option to seek assistance from their local special agent in charge. Non-practitioners cannot, non-practitioners can transport sealed interliners for destruction, but practitioners cannot. We also would like to emphasize that since the interliner cannot be opened after it's been sealed, destruction must be of the entire liner and its contents. Next slide, please. When an uh, authorized collector would like to cease collection activities, the authorized collector simply notifies the DEA in writing or online. 
There are special provisions with respect to ceasing and authorized mailback program, most important of which is that the authorized collector must make arrangements to have another authorized collector receive any return mailback packages. The authorized collector must also provide the DEA with the name, address, and DEA number of the new collector that will receive those remaining packages. This is, of course, another mechanism by which to help prevent, detect, and divert diversion of collected substances. Next slide, please. Last, the DEA would like to encourage um, community efforts, such as educating the community and conducting take-back events. Thank you very much. I would now like to turn the webinar over to Supervisor Miley from Alameda, California. Thank you. Thank you. In Alameda County, uh, it took us about four years to develop our ordinance. And it originated as a result of um, efforts of our Alameda County Senior Alcohol and Other Drugs um, campaign. And this was pr pretty much sponsored by a local organization, which was a drug-free communities uh, grantee. And we were able to do a lot of this without a lot of resources, uh, primarily because the, the grantee, the drug-free communities grantee, through the alcohol uh, and other drugs uh, coalition, engaged my office. And we basically took responsibility for coordinating the effort and uh, bringing in uh, other county uh, entities to be a part of um, uh, our, our grassroots um, effort to develop the ordinance. So in 2008, the uh, Alameda County Senior AOD effort uh, went about an assessment, it went about coalition building, and it went about uh, policy. And to my surprise, I didn't recognize that this was even an issue until uh, this effort started. And the focus was primarily on seniors. Then another uh, drug-free communities grantee, which was the, the Castro Valley Community Action Network, became engaged. And they demonstrated that this issue was not only a concern among seniors, but also um, uh, youth in terms of uh, the misuse of um, uh, prescription drugs. So at that point, it became apparent to me that this was both an environmental issue, a uh, public safety issue, and a public health issue. So we expanded the um, senior AOD to become what we now call our Medication Education uh, Disposal Safety Coalition, which is um, uh, uh, an effort composed of uh, community-based groups, um, public entities, and others to try to um, uh, move this, uh, this agenda. And this was around 2011. So we decided that uh, our policy focus would be the development of an ordinance. That's where we zeroed in on. And we went about uh, conducting a number of meetings uh, over the course of time. We even uh, decided to hold a conference uh, to bring more awareness around this and also to see whether or not uh, there was support to move ahead with an, with an ordinance. And at one point we were considering, instead of having the Board of Supervisors adopt an ordinance, maybe doing a, a campaign and having an initiative uh, to get the electorate to do an ordinance. But in the final analysis after the conference and further discussion and, and further uh, thought around the strategy, it was decided to take it to the Board of Supervisors. So we did take it to the Board of Supervisors. And all along, we felt we were keeping the, um, uh, the industry aware of what we were doing. But when it got to the Board in February of 2012, um, and the Board adopted it, the industry uh, then said they were not aware of our efforts. So to try to make sure every, it was all inclusive of, of all stakeholders, we went back and from April of 2012 until roughly uh, June of 2012, we conducted about a half a dozen stakeholder meetings that were very comprehensive with the industry and others to see if we could come up with some consensus around uh, the, uh, the ordinance. When uh, we couldn't come up with consensus mainly uh, from the industry, uh, the ordinance was um, finalized and taken to the Board of Supervisors and adopted in uh, July of 2012. But the important thing is to recognize that this effort 
that started in, in 08 started with its focus on seniors. And it started with uh, engaging an elected official, which was myself, in this, because I was quite new to all of this uh, type of concern. And it was the community that drove this. This wasn't something that was top down. This was bottom up that was uh, uh, dri driving our development of the ordinance. And then the Board of Supervisors recognizing after four years of work on this and the, the need for this ordinance and the public policy associated with this ordinance felt comfortable adopting it despite the fact that um, uh, the industry said they would challenge it. So what I'd like to do now is turn it over to Kathleen Pacheco, who's uh, Senior Count, uh, Deputy County Counsel, and she'll talk to you a little bit about the ordinance. Tonight, yeah. changing speakers, uh, uh, Bill Pollack is next. Um, I'm the Program Manager for the Alameda County Household Hazardous Waste Program. Our current pharmaceutical program in Alameda County is in reality 31 sites funded and managed by nine different municipal and government agencies working together. We're more like a flock of geese flying in the same direction, mostly, rather than a single centrally managed program. Um, uh, in addition to what Super Miley, Supervisor Miley was talking about, uh, all, uh, the wastewater people in the early 2000s were starting to notice uh, pharmaceuticals showing up in groundwater. Uh, and they got together to start to work on the problem uh, to change the practice of flush disposal. And collection was identified as an important tool to in address, in part, some of the environmental, environmental issues. To do this, they needed to find alternative methods of col uh, collection and disposal. And as an organized group approached the household hazardous waste folks, facilitated by a state agency, Cal Recycle. But household hazardous waste programs aren't the answer. There are only about 135 of them in California for 38 million people not nearly enough. So they independently started to fund and operate drug collection programs, starting with one-day events and evol evolving to kiosks. Uh, and it's about this time in 2008 that they joined with uh, the senior AOD groups and, and uh, the teen and abuse prevention groups uh, to make our medication disposal uh, program. Um, um, we decided to pass an ordinance based on product stewardship. For those that aren't familiar with product stewardship, it's the concept that these very predictable problems caused by spent and residual products should be handled by the industry that made them, and the cost of handling should be built into the cost of the product as a normal cost of doing business. Industry should be the one to organize and execute the collection programs. Government's role is just oversight. It's smaller government. In 2011, right across the bay from us, San Francisco was taking a shot at passing a product stewardship ordinance, and we were watching closely. There, the pharmaceutical industry funded a pilot program run by the city and the ordinance was put on hold. We were up next. Our ordinance applies to producers of prescription drugs whose products are sold in Alameda County. They need to create or join a product stewardship organization, which they've done, file a product stewardship plan describing how they'll establish collection sites, collect unwanted products, educate the public and promote the program, support law enforcement if they choose to collect controlled substances. Remember, th this ordinance was written before the new DEA regs came out. They need to file annual reports describing their activities and pay all the costs of collection and disposal and reasonable costs of oversight and regulation. No point of sale fee can be charged, but they are free to raise their prices as they see fit, just like any other cost of doing business. Clinical use only drugs that never leave the hospital or clinic can be exempted and hauling is to be done by a medical or hazardous waste hauler with disposal by incineration. Right now, we're in the middle of the, of the uh, stewardship process. Uh, industry has formed the Pharmaceutical Product Stewardship Working Group and filed the stewardship plan, which is in the review stage. We're having good interactions with them, and we're optimistic that we'll come up with a good program. There's a link on, to our website uh, in a later slide that, which has the ordinance and regulations and other useful documents, and we'll have links to other sites that you may find useful. There's also an email link on our web page if you have more questions. Hi, I'm Kathleen Pacheco. I'm a senior deputy county counsel with the Alameda County Council's office. And as Supervisor Miley said, we did anticipate a lawsuit. And a lawsuit was filed by the trade associations. So no individual pharmaceutical company has sued the county. The um, 
plaintiffs are all trade associations, and they're listed on your slide there. The Pharmaceutical Research and Manufacturers of America, the Generic Pharmaceutical Association, and the Biotechnology Industry Association. The suit was filed in federal court claiming the ordinance violated the Dormant Commerce Clause of the U.S. Constitution by placing an unfair burden on interstate commerce. They did request a stay to our ordinance pending the outcome of the litigation, with the, which the county decided not to enter into. We did want to move forward with implementing the ordinance because we knew it would be time consuming. So while the lawsuit was going on, our ordinance stayed in place. Um, as I indicated, no individual drug company or pharmaceutical company sued the county, and we were fortunate in that a number of companies contacted us and began to start discussions about compliance with the ordinance. Um, in the lawsuit, um, there was a stipulation to the facts so that the litigation could move forward quickly. So there were motions for summary judgments filed by both the plaintiffs and the county, and it went before the lower court for oral argument on June 27, 2013. The ordinance, you may re recall, was passed in July 2012. The lawsuit was filed in December 2012, so it moved forward fairly fast. The lower court acknowledged that this was an issue of importance, so did rule fairly quickly on this matter. The lower court ruled in favor of the county, holding that the ordinance did not discriminate against out-of-state actors in favor of local persons or entities and does not otherwise impede the burden, uh, otherwise impermissibly burden interstate commerce. Uh, the lower court found the county had adequately shown that the ordinance serves a legitimate public health and safety interest and the relatively modest compliance costs producers will incur should they choose to sell their products in the county do not unduly burden interstate commerce. The trade associations did file an appeal with the Ninth, Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, and again, we were fortunate that the court agreed to expedite the briefing schedule. So both the plaintiffs um, and the county agreed to move forward with an expedited briefing schedule. Um, a number of amicus briefs, which are briefs supporting one side or the other, were filed um, both opposing the ordinance and in support of the ordinance. Um, the Washington Legal Foundation with the California Healthcare Institute and the Chamber of Commerce of the United States filed um, briefs um, supporting the opposition to the ordinance by the trade associations, and three amicus briefs were filed in support of the county's position and the ordinance by the California State Association of Counties with the League of California Cities, and that was drafted by the Santa Clara County Council's Office. The National Resource Defense Council filed a brief in support of the ordinance, and the California Attorney General did. Again, because the court was willing to expedite the scheduling, we received um, an oral argument date in September of um, 2004, excuse me, the decision came down in December 2013, or 2014. The Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals affirmed the district court's summary judgment holding that the ordinance is constitutional under the Commerce Clause. Um, the court um, wrote a very succinct um, opinion addressing each of the arguments raised and very similar, what we felt was a very summary um, disposition of their arguments. Again, ultimately finding that the county could pass this ordinance. It did not um, have anything unconstitutional concerning the Commerce Clause. So we are now in the position of moving forward with our ordinance. And as um, Bill indicated, working with the group that's been created um, to hopefully you know, create a plan that will benefit the residents of Alameda County, that is something that the pharmaceutical companies will be able to support and um, assist with the safe disposal of medications that are accessible to everyone. And with that, I'll pass it back to the moderator to um, address any questions.
All right, and now we will shift into our question and answer session here. So let us go through some of the questions that were pre-submitted by our audience members. So the first question here is directed to ONDCP. Um, many of our audience members asked about how to fund these programs. Hi, our directors had to step out. This is Cece Stutznaz at ONDCP. And although the rule, the rule does not address how the program is to be funded, it does say that it is permissible to charge for disposal. Um, options include privately funded programs or programs using, a donation, using donations. Drug stewardship ordinances like Alameda counties may also be an option. And we have heard from our drug-free communities program um, administrator here that it is possible to use CSC funds provided that there is a, um, a plan for sustainability and um, that needs to be something that gets worked out. Thank you. All right, the second question here is for DEA and comes from Patty Gregory at Seven County Services in Louisville, Kentucky. Do controlled substances still have to be disposed of at, a, at DEA approved incinerators? First, it's important to note that DEA does not approve or register incinerators as such. Rather, DEA registers reverse distributors, many of which have an on-site incinerator that is in compliance with all applicable federal, state, and local laws and regulations. As we discussed during the presentation, registered practitioners and non-practitioners have different methods by which each may transfer controlled substances for destruction. The new, the new rule requires registrants that destroy controlled substances to render the substances non-retrievable. And currently, incineration is the most popular method that can accomplish this. All right, the next question is for Alameda and comes from a variety of different sources. What advice do you have for establishing alternative collection locations and programs and what successes have you had? It's critical to have local community members and organizations involved in the process. They have the personal stories that need to be told that highlight the need to have the available convenient take back locations. The impact that grassroots organizations have cannot be overstated. Our local groups were instrumental in raising awareness, identifying the problem, and supporting local solutions. The community also needs to let their retailers know that convenient take-back kiosks are critically needed service. And the community needs to reward the retailers that step up to provide the service. Um, the success that we've had is that we have an ordinance where producers will begin collecting medications in a more structured approach. This will move from a limited network of existing kiosks funded by a hodgepodge of different agencies to a well-organized and funded countywide program adequate to, to meet the needs of the population. All right. The next question is for DEA and comes from Howard Anderson at the North Dakota Board of Pharmacy. Can we change the two people requirement for a pickup? DEA, can you please explain the rationale for the two person requirement? The DEA believes that the two employee integrity requirement is a necessary security measure to effectively guard against diversion and to ensure that the controlled substances are handled, transferred, and recorded in a manner that is consistent with applicable laws and regulations. Furthermore, adherence to the two employee integrity requirement will provide accountability for the controlled substances during the destruction process, preventing possible loss, theft, and diversion of the controlled substances. The next question, uh, again, is for Alameda, and we've received it from a variety of different sources. How does the community decide how much to ask for to fund a programming if using an ordinance like Alameda's? Could Alameda talk about how they determine the structure of their ordinance? Well, the concept behind Alameda County's product stewardship ordinance is that it's the job of the producers of the drugs to organize, finance, and operate the collection and disposal. Um, it, it's not up to government to ask for a, a particular amount of money. The government's role is simply oversight in providing assistance and direction to the stewardship group on what programs may work locally. It's smaller government. All right, the next question is for DEA from Liana Brand at the Substance Free Workplace, Workplace Program, Illinois Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. Will certain organizations be mandated to act as disposal sites or must they volunteer? 
the Disposal Act prohibited DEA from requiring any entity to establish a disposal program. Participation is completely voluntary. Thank you. The next question is for ONDCP and comes from Barbara Simaglio at the Vermont Department of Health. What role can the state substance abuse authorities play in promoting a coordinated statewide approach to disposal? Hello, this is Luis Malero from ONDCP. The SSAs are uniquely situated to reach out to opioid treatment programs to encourage them to register as collectors and also to inform pharmacies and long-term care facilities about the rule. They can act as a clearinghouse for state disposal sites and information. Where appropriate, via their contacts and task forces, they can publicize the need to engage in disposal. In some cases, there, they may be, there may be a resource for funding or may consider requesting funding during their state budget allocation process. All right, the next question is again for ONDCP and came from several sources. How will the new approval for pharmacies to collect unused control substances work with states that have legislation that authorize only a designated law enforcement agency to do this? States interested in taking full advantage of the new abilities the final rule affords may want to consider introducing applicable, applicable legislation. All right, the next question is for DEA from Kaylin Kelly in the Montana Attorney General's Office. What is an example besides incineration or using a reverse distributor of a destruction method that meets the non-retrievable standard set forth in the new rule? First, uh, we would like to emphasize that the non-retrievable standard does not apply to law enforcement entities. The standard only applies to registrants that destroy controlled substances. Incineration and chemical digestion are some examples of current technology that may be utilized to achieve the non-retrievable standard. The term non-retrievable is results-oriented because the DEA's concern is that the substance be permanently rendered to an unusable state. The result is a standard that allows flexibility so long as the desired result is achieved, thus allowing for technological innovation and development. All right, the next question is for DEA and comes from Nora Anderson from the Community Prevention Coalition of Jackson County. Disposal Methods asks, what is allowed and recommended, especially in rural areas where in-county disposal methods, like incinerators, may not be available? The DEA has attempted to expand the variety of disposal options available to the public. And the DEA hopes that retail pharmacies and hospital clinics will become authorized as collectors, including those in rural areas. An incinerator is not a necessary prerequisite to, become a to becoming a collector with receptacles at your registered location. These collectors can send sealed inner liners to a reverse distributor by common or contract carrier or by reverse distributor pickup. Also, communities can partner with reverse distributors to make empty mailback packages available to the public. The sealed mailback packages will be mailed to the reverse distributor's location for on-site destruction. Nonetheless, the DEA recognizes that some ultimate users may not have convenient access to any of the disposal options available in this rule. Until the availability of these disposal options increases, ultimate users who wish to dispose of unwanted pharmaceutical controlled substances may continue to dispose of them in manners consistent with all applicable federal state, tribal, and local laws and regulations. The DEA website provides information regarding safe disposal of pharmaceutical controlled substances, including guidance from the FDA and the EPA. All right, and the next question we have here, I believe, is asked in our queue. Uh, this question is, again, for Alameda. What can non-law enforcement do to help law enforcement with a take-back event? Uh, the Key factors for any successful take-back event are outreach, publicity, and education. The public needs to know exactly what to do, for instance, whether to leave their pills in original containers or empty them into Ziploc bags, blacking out personal information from pill containers and where to go. Uh, all types of groups can help distribute information from student groups to senior groups and everywhere in between. All right, and I believe that was the last of our questions here in the queue. Thank you very much for participating today. I believe there's one more slide that has um, links to um, further information. 
And again, the webinar will be archived on ONDCP site. We appreciate everyone's time today and that of our presenters.